Good morning, friends. Welcome to the Flora United Methodist Church. It's October the 17th. Oh, my goodness, the weekend, my goodness. Y'all pray for my Golden Eagles. We need to win us a football game or two. This is, this is not the year of the Eagle, but, uh, you know, the Bulldogs are doing good. The Rebs are doing good. Alabama is always Alabama. How about Texas A&M? And you know who doesn't care about football and all that kind of stuff? I don't think God cares about it. If he had a favorite team, I uh, just find out what that team is and bet on. I don't even know if uh, if uh, uh, if God got all wound up over sports like we do, he would just stay wound up all the time. <laughs> I'm so glad that he rises above all that and he cares about all things. I wouldn't say I would say this about God: He cares about the players and the coaches. That's for sure, because he cares about people. Absolutely, he cares about people. Friends, I'm glad you're here today. I wish you were here in person, but I'm glad to see you through this lens. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Just a week ago, we had Sister Bernadine, Dr. Bernadine Wormley Daniels, all the way from Detroit, Michigan, and she was with us last Sunday night. And I tell you, that we had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we haven't had around here in a long, long, long time. God touched and he blessed. And I believe we saw miracles. Some miracles I saw with my eyes. And others I haven't had a report yet. Uh, but it was, it was great. We had a good Sunday night crowd had 85 here. 85 people came out on Sunday night. We don't have Sunday night services here. So you, our Sunday night crowd is usually zero. <laughs> But, but that night, and we had the full praise band. I think there were eight or nine in the praise band. Drummers, guitar players, uh, keyboard players, and singers, and, and all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of just uh, uh, music. And I'll tell you, they raised the roof. And there was just, it was just a sweet and precious and powerful thing for us to be, for us to be, uh, sitting in this auditorium worshiping God and and there Pastor Bernie was in in the bullpen warming up holding my sister socks in her hands and and praying on she she held them in, in her hand for over an hour <laughs> and uh, it was such a wonderful thing you had to be there I know that may not mean anything to you but it means a lot to us and it meant something to everybody in this room and uh, we just believe God is going to do great things. Friends, let me ask you something. Are you ready to worship the Lord this morning? You are in for a treat. You know Nora Kate. You know her because she is a, a prodigious violin player. Uh, we say fiddle, but she doesn't fiddle. She plays, you know, uh, actual violin. I don't know what you call that, highbrow music. And, uh, and she's super smart, and she's super gifted, and there's nothing that she cannot do. And, uh, and she does a little bit of everything around here. I mean, she runs track. She's a cheerleader. Uh, she, uh, she can sew, and uh, she helps take care of her baby sister, Rosie. She helps her parents and her grandparents and and she's a, uh, she's a prodigy. And uh, anyway, there's, I know, I know a lot of people. I, I, I've been to five continents, I believe. One, two, three, four. Yeah, I've been to five continents. And I have met one Nora Kate. <laughs> and she's right here in Flora, Mississippi. And she's over here with her grandmother and her uncle Mike, and they are going to sing. So, friends, let's let's go right now. And uh, and uh, uh, Nora Kate's going to sing right to us. <laughs> She's got a message for us in song. Hey, sweetie, take it away. How you do 
Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sweetheart. We're so happy to have you here doing this for us today. It's so wonderful. Friends, if you were here yes, uh, last Sunday morning and you came last Sunday night, you noticed that, that uh, Bernadine's sermon picked up where mine left off, and, and that was just a God thing. We did not synchronize our preaching or our scripture. And You know, the Bible's a big old book, and... Uh, it was so tremendous. I'll ask Trooper if he's got, uh, maybe if you weren't here, you'd like to see. Maybe we can make that available to you. But I'm going to pick up here where Bernadine left off. Not, not gonna, I'm not going to re-preach her sermon, but I'm going to invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, then Philippians and Colossians. If you'll just... Look through that section of the Bible, you'll come across Philippians, and it is such a wonderful book. Where Bernadine left off, I won't reread that. It, she did the first 11 verses, and it, it, it is actually a hymn. It, it was an early hymn, and Paul's quoting a hymn. And the hymn's about how Jesus emptied himself of his divinity and became a man 
and did all of the miracles he did as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't raise somebody from the dead because he was God. He did it as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not sinless because he was God. He was sinless because he was a man full of the Holy Spirit, obedient to his Father. And so that's what that is about. And because he did it that way, because of the incarnation, God gave him an even greater name than he had before. Yeshua or Yahweh, you know the Old Testament names for, for the Lord. He gave him an even greater name. And how can, how can your name be great? If your name is already perfect, how can it be greater? Well, it's, it's more perfect. It's more glorious. And so Jesus did that wonderful thing. So look with me, friends, down at verse 12 of Philippians, the church at Philippi, right? Chapter 2, this is in uh, Asia Minor, Turkey. Chapter 2, verse 12. And he says, in light of Jesus' humility, in light of the incarnation, in light of his perfection, in light of of everything he did, obeying the Father and becoming one of us in the incarnation, God gave him an even greater name. He said, and in light of this, my dear friends, you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Just in light of everything that Jesus has done for you, let's do much for him. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good purpose. What it means is you may not want to do good, but God can give you the desire to want to do good. <laughs> Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever thought about that? Said, Lord, what I really want to do is punch him in the nose but Lord I want you to take that will away from me that desire away from me and give me a desire to forgive him I don't want to forgive him but you can make me want to forgive him and see that's a really that's an act of surrender right there it's just tremendous look at verse 14 do everything without complaining or arguing it's one good thing I like about about Flora and Ben Tony. I've been up here a long time, 16 and a half years, and we hardly ever have a fight, ever. We have about 30 people now at Ben Tony every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Most of them go here, but they're going down there and they're supporting that, that church. So I preach the, to, in my two services combined, uh, we preach... Uh, a great Sunday would be 200, at both services combined. A pre-COVID service, we would be at 200 every Sunday, but, but since the COVID has come, we don't get that many people back. But, uh, but one thing we don't do a lot of around here is fighting. And, uh, and, and, and part of it is just the character of our congregation. We don't do a lot of arguing. But part of it is, is, that, uh, is that I don't care. <laughs> Somebody may ask me, uh, what color carpet do you have in the church? Or what color grape juice do you use when you have communion on, on Sunday mornings? And you know what I say? I don't care. <laughs> you know, that's how, how in the world, if you're a Methodist, I get this a lot, you're a Methodist and you've been here, you're in your 17th year, you're a Methodist, how can you stay in a Methodist church for 17 years? What's, what's the secret to your success? I'm, I'm going to tell you what it is right now. I don't care. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. I care about one thing. I care about the person in the pew as an individual. That's what I care. I care about their heart. I care about their soul. I care about their families. I don't care about anything else. Should we go with 60-watt light bulbs or 100-watt light bulbs? I don't care. <laughs> That's how you stay. right? Should we pave the parking lot or should we put gravel out there? I don't 
care. You're starting to pick up this, aren't you, a little bit. Look what he says, do everything in the church without complaining or arguing so that you may become, eventually become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Just because the culture is going to hell doesn't mean you have to, amen? Did y'all catch that? In which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, as you hold forth the word of life, as you hold on to the word of life. That little passage right there has a lot of, that is a a prepositional phrase that is translated lots of different ways in the different versions of the Bible. So we hold forth the word of life. We hold on to it. We hold out, uh, you know, hold on. In order that I may boast, On the day that Jesus returns, that I did not run or labor for nothing. I I was fully invested in his kingdom is what he means. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice for me. You know what's interesting about this passage? Paul's writing it from prison. (laughs) You know, prison life, we have a lot of people. We have a prison not far from here. We have a jail not far from here. And, and uh, uh, prison life is not for everybody. I think some people go to prison, they do pretty well. They, I mean, they respond to the structure, that kind of thing. You know, people have their lives changed in jail, and they come out, and they're very productive citizens. Some people go to jail or to prison, and it's just pure and oh, unshirted hell. But prison's life is not for everyone, but Paul always made the best of it, the best of it. He had an attitude. He had an attitude. Robert Schuller, you remember from the, the hour of power, Robert Schuller, who had preached in the big glass church, a uh, very erudite guy, uh, Dr. Robert Schuller. Uh, he, would, he had these cliches he used in his preaching he would say uh, tough times don't last tough people do stuff like that he had one about attitude he says uh, your attitude will determine your altitude (laughs) okay that's pretty good your attitude will determine how high you go how far you go in life I believe that okay he says that, and that's, and that's great. But here, the story changes a little bit. Paul has a couple of co- companions that he's watching after them, and they're watching after him. One's name is Timothy, and you hear about him every year on, on Mother's Day. Uh, you get a billion sermons on Timothy. and Because uh, Timothy was raised by women. Their names were Lois and Eunice. They were his mother and his grandmother. And they raised him in the faith. And so let's hear it for the girls. Let's hear it for the mamas. Okay, that's a good, good, good place. But Paul has a tender spot toward these people. You remember, you remember Paul had a fallen out with John. And, and Barnabas came and took him away from Paul because he, he just, Barnabas just didn't like the way Paul was treating him. And, and he was just brutal to him. And, and you know what? I, I just hate that. Uh, uh, you know, when you get that kind of uh, tension in, among these apostles. Peter and Paul fought with each other. And, and, you know, they had a lot of stuff that went on in the early church. Some people say, well, the church, the, the Bible's full of fanciful uh, tales. These people in there, they just aren't human. They're just not normal people. I would beg to... Differ. I would say to you that they're, the Bible's full of normal people with everyday egos and, and, and all of that just plays out. And, but from here to the end of the chapter, it's about a, a special relationship Paul has with these guys. And that's what I want us to tune in on this morning. I, I, I said the other just to sort of set the stage so that we would have some context of what we were preaching this morning. But take a look at verse 19, and let's go to the end of the chapter. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord 
Jesus to send Timothy to see you soon. Send him to Philippi. That I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. He said, I'm in prison, but when I hear the good things you're doing in your churches, it lifts my spirit. That's what he means. I have no one else quite like Timothy who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proven himself because as a son, as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. He didn't have a biological father to speak of. Somebody was his father. So Paul said, he's like my son. So he said, he's like a father in the faith or a spiritual father to Timothy. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I can, as soon as I can see how things are going with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will be able to come soon. I'm going to get out of prison eventually. <laughs> and, and when I do, I'm going to come see you. Well, it, it didn't exactly work out that way for Paul, but we know that Paul's heart, he just wanted to go visit his people. And look at verse 25. I tell you, I could hardly read this without, just without feeling the emotion of this. This is so powerful. It's about a, a man named Epaphroditus. Paul mentions him here. He said, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my brother in Christ, he means, a fellow worker in the vineyard, in the kingdom, a fellow soldier in the army of the Lord, who is also your messenger. Messenger there is translated uh, euangelion. It means your evangelist. Or, or an angel. Uh, the word angel means good message. Whom you sent to take care of my needs. You sent this brother to me to take care of me. And he's been like a brother to me, a fellow soldier to me. He has been a fellow worker to me. He is a messenger of good news to me. He came from you. You sent him. You Philippians sent him out of your church to me because you knew I was in prison and I might need some help and you sent him to me. That's just precious. What happened, friends, was that when Epaphroditus got to Paul, Epaphroditus got sick. And it was a sickness unto death. I mean, everybody, had, every, everybody in the Bible sick all the time. It's that uh, stomach sickness. And, and that's why Paul said, you know, the water is not worth drinking. You need to drink some wine. It's better for your stomach. I know uh, when, I, when I tell people the Bible says you should drink a little wine and stay away from water, they, uh, they want to stone me. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you want to stone me. If I were to say to you, uh, Jesus not only turned water into wine, he drank it, what would you say to me? Would you stone me? Or would you just accept that as the Bible record? Yikes. Woo, I'm getting in trouble now. I, uh. But he got sick. He didn't have a little stomach ailment. He got sick. He said, for he longs for all of you, and he's homesick. And he's distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill. And he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow after sorrow, sorrow upon sorrow, sorrows squared, sorrows multiplied, he said. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him to you, Send him back to you, he means, so that when you see him, that you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Isn't that precious? I tell you, friends, that is amazing. The book of Philippians is, it's, I don't know, 
I'm not going to suggest that, it, that it's everybody's favorite book. I would suggest that it, it of, of the epistles. I mean, you, it's hard to compare anything to Romans. You know, Romans is so comprehensive, it's so long, and, 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 and boy, you just weave your way through Romans, and, and you learn so much good doctrine in Romans. And Ephesians has 12 or 15 blessings offered to you in the first chapter just that are yours. Not goals that you can aspire to, but blessings that are yours through Christ. Christ just gives you, and boy, you could just spend the rest of your life reading the first chapter of Ephesians. But friends, Philippians is a book about joy. And 16 times in this tiny little letter, 16 times it says, have joy, or uses the word rejoice. 16 times. You get the idea as you, as you read it that Paul really cares about your joy. In the Old Testament, we quote Nehemiah who says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And Paul is sort of taking that and upping it. And he's telling us that, boy, joy is really critical. Joy is critical in our lives. It's critical to our spiritual lives. It's critical to our physical health. It's critical to our emotional health. And it's critical to our spiritual health. Joy is so critical. Friends, I know that uh, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, I think you can do outwardly do it. I, I know people who outwardly do it. If you ask them, how you doing? Uh, hallelujah, I'm blessed, too blessed to be stressed. You know, they got it on their T-shirt, got it on their bumper car, on their bumper sticker and all that kind of stuff. And, and they just want to keep that sort of that, uh, you know, I'm above it all kind of attitude. And that's fine, but still, I wonder how much of that is, is how much of that is bumper sticker and how much of that is real. And Nora Kate just challenged us just a few minutes ago. Uh... She said, the truth be told. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. Tell me the truth. Nah, I'm not doing so great. <laughs> you know, uh, Billy Joel, one of his, I think it's his second album, he, he, he had a song on there called Honesty is Such a Lonely Word. Everything is so, or everyone is so untrue. But, if you meet somebody that has authentic joy, doesn't that just move you? It really, it really, does it inspire you? When I meet somebody who can just, who can just uh, be, as Paul writes to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Who can just, actually live out that ideal, friends. That is tremendous. I tell you, Paul was in prison, and prison life is not cracked up to what... <laughs> no, it's not always cracked up to what it's supposed to be. Uh, that's, cr prison life is, is not for anyone. And, uh, and, and he's writing from prison. And, and I tell you, he... He has had such a rough life. When you read second, the second epistle to the Corinthians, it lists all the things that Paul went through. And uh, he talks about shipwrecked and being beat with a cat of nine tails. And he talks about being left for dead. And, 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 uh, and one time he died. I mean, they beat him to death. And, and God just raised him from the dead. And he just got up and went on about his business. You know, Paul had such a... He had such a brutal life, and he found that the strength in life comes from joy. He's, he's tuned in there with Nehemiah. And Paul draws his joy from how he sees the churches that he's planted and the churches that he's sort of the apostolic overseer of, the churches where he's 
been and the places where he's been where he's poured into them and you see those those churches are flourishing and those churches are doing well Paul just he 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 just exalts in that you you remember Victor Frankl psychologist German Germany World War II Jewish in a uh, in one of the dot Nazi concentration camps and he was there Victor Frankl was there, and as a, as a trained psychologist, he's watching. He's watching, and he sees people who are dying, and then people who are not dying. And uh, he begins to notice how the people who die and the people who don't die, how they live. And he said, they get a ration of bread, just a little piece of bread every day. Not enough to sustain life, but just a little piece of bread. And so they would just keep it, just nibble on it all through the day because they don't know when they might get another piece. And, and people would, the prisoners there, would become afraid. And they knew they were starving to death. And they would sneak up on other prisoners and steal their ration of bread. And he said this, he said, the people who stole rations of bread, who got two rations that day, or three rations, they had theirs and they had two more pieces because they stole it from a couple other people. He said they died first. But he noticed, and Corey Ten Boom said the same thing. She was in Ravensbrück, another concentration camp. Uh, Victor Frankl said the people who had a ration of bread who would look around their, their cell, look around that, that, that rat-infested prison, and they would see somebody who's sick, who's weak, who was at death's door, who couldn't make it another day. They would go to that person and they would give their bread to them. He said, those are the people who survived the Nazi concentration camp. Those who stole their bread died. Those who shared their bread lived. Paul has this attitude. He, he was living and dying uh, spiritually and emotionally by the reports that he's getting from these other church, and, and churches where he's planted. And, and he he gets a good report that the church that he planted somewhere is doing well and, and it causes his heart to sing. And then he, he gets the report and he hears that a church is really suffering and it just causes him such agony. So with that in mind, we're, we're going to end here. We need a short sermon and we'll just end it here. But I want, to, I want to share with you, you know, we read this entire passage. I paraphrased the first 11 verses and then I read uh, all of the rest of it to you. But I, I want to show you Paul's heart and how, how his, his authentic love empowered him. He had... Timothy was his main guy. You know, he blew John Mark off, and, he, and he's gone. And so, I mean, that's tough, isn't it? So uh, Mark's with, uh, with Barnabas. Barnabas' name means to encourage. So that's the, he had the character of his name. And Timothy was his soldier and his brother, and it was his spiritual son, and he said, I want you to go and plant these churches, and Timothy was so upset, he didn't want, he was going to leave the ministry, and he became afraid, and Paul just climbed him, you remember that, and said, man, don't do that, he said, do you remember Lois and Eunice, your mother and grandmother, they had faith, and 
Just stir up the faith that's in you. God did not give you a spirit of fear. He said, when I laid my hands on you, I imparted a gift to you. I prophesied over you like Bernadine. Now you receive that prophecy and you get up and you dust yourself off and you quit complaining and you go to preaching, man. And, and Timothy did. And Paul just bragged on him so much because Timothy was young and he had so much to overcome. But Epaphroditus is a little bit different. He is from the Philippian church, from Philippi. And uh, the Christians at Philippi loved Paul. And so they sent Epaphroditus to Paul to tell Paul how well everything was going so that Paul's heart would sing. So that Paul would know that his preaching and his ministry was not in vain. That he, that he knew, would know that the church at Philippi was, was carrying on. Doing what, he, doing what he had called them to do. It was just a marvelous thing. And, and, that, and they cared about Paul that they took one of their young bucks. One of their young uh, uh, whippersnappers. One of their, you know, somebody that church is really proud of when... Like, uh, like uh, when you hear when we had so many Kane and and Carlton and and uh, uh, Justin Allard and and uh, these guys they joined the military and Reagan Reagan and uh, different ones Grace Powell from a long time ago a woman in, that went to Iran we have these young bucks they joined the military and we're so proud of them when they go and they do their duty. Well, that's the kind of relationship Paul has with his church, and they send him Epaphroditus to help him because Paul's in prison and he needs some help. And Epaphroditus came, but when he got there, he got sick. And then Paul didn't know what he was going to do. And he wasn't just a little bit sick, and it wasn't traveler's diarrhea which was typical of everybody in those days, that Paul actually included traveler's diarrhea in the Bible. He gave you a, a, he gave you a medicine for traveler's diarrhea in the Bible. It's a, it's a well, just go with me to Cuba. And you'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll let you know how, how <laughs> you'll understand. He, it, wasn't, it wasn't traveler's diarrhea. He got sick unto death. And this church that Paul loved so much sent sent him their star, their star pupil. And now he's at the point of death. So Paul's worried about that. What's that going to do to them? What's, what's that going to do to Epaphroditus' mama? How's she going to respond to that? And God did a miracle. He healed Epaphroditus. He raised him up off his sickbed. And he restored him where he could go back and give the good message, the good news of what God was doing through Paul in a prison. And what's, uh, it's a remarkable story. But let me tell you how Paul interpreted that miracle. I learned something from, from reading this. And let, let, let me read it, let me read it to you. This is, I, I don't think that perhaps you've ever looked at it this way. Let, let's look at verse 27. Indeed, Epaphroditus was ill, and he almost died, but God had mercy on him, but not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow on top of sorrow. Paul said, Paul said, God was so merciful to me that he healed my friend. God loved me so much that he healed my friend. 
Friends, have you ever, have you ever been to the Lord to pray that way? I'm going to suggest that you haven't. I'm going to suggest to you that nobody watching me has prayed that way. And furthermore, I'm going to suggest to you that we should. It sounds selfish. I don't think. I don't think Paul is selfish. This is what he said. He said, God showed mercy to Epaphroditus and he healed him. But it wasn't just to Epaphroditus. It was mercy for me. It was mercy for me. You got somebody you're praying for. It's a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister an uncle or an aunt, a friend or a neighbor, a mom or a dad or a grandmother or grandfather. And boy, you just hate it that they're suffering. And their suffering is really intense. And you really hate it for them. But Paul said, I didn't just hate it for Epaphroditus. I hated it for me. I didn't want to lose another friend. I didn't want to have to face this congregation with another death. And he said, God showed mercy not only to Epaphroditus when he healed him, but he also showed it to me to spare me from the sorrow of losing Epaphroditus. Friends, can I ask you this morning if you would be willing to pray that way just today? I'm going to ask you, you say, I don't know, that sounds selfish. Uh, yeah. Friends, I'm going to ask you to lay that aside. I'm going to ask you to lay that aside and don't get entangled with things that you really don't know about. I'm going to ask you to pray a more honest prayer. You know what, friends? There have been numerous people that I've prayed for over the years. Some have lived and some have died. But I've prayed for them. And and when I prayed for them, I prayed for them. When I prayed for them, I prayed for them. And on a broader scale particularly if it's a younger person I'll pray for them and I'll pray not just for them but for their family maybe it's a sick baby and we're praying not only for the sick baby but also for that sick baby's mama and that sick baby's daddy and that sick baby's grandmother or grandfather maybe that sick baby's got some brothers or some sisters you pray so you sort of broaden that prayer out a little bit, you see. And I pray, Lord, not only for this sick child, but I pray for everybody involved with a sick child. Uncles and aunts and cousins and all of those who've gathered together. And, that. And, and, and we have prayed, you have prayed, and I have prayed that way many, many, many times. What I'm going to ask you to do today is to include yourself in that. You might, your prayer might sound something like this. God, my friend, right over here, right back by the sound booth, my friend John is hurting and he's sick and he might be sick unto death. This thing is killing him. And Lord, I I would ask you, I would ask you to heal John, heal him of his disease. Heal him, God, so that he'll be well. And do it for his wife, Jill, and his kids, Biff and Mary Ann, and his mama, uh, Sally, and his daddy, Elmo. I think of all of them. But I'm going to ask you to add this this to your prayer. That's a fine way to pray. I'm going to ask you to add this to your prayer. 
Lord, I ask you to heal John. And I ask you to do it for me. <laughs> because John is a friend of mine. And I don't want to lose another friend. <laughs> Lord, I've been through plenty during this uh, COVID and the recession and the war and Afghanistan and all the hellacious things we've been through as a people and I've just been through enough. So God, I ask you to heal John. Do it, God, not just for John, but do it for John and John's family and do it for me, God. Heal him for me. You can heal him for Christ's sake. You can heal him for John's sake. But God, heal him for my sake. Did you read that? It, did that not jump off the page at you when you read that? That, that little truth has been buried in the second chapter of Ephesians uh, for 2,000 years. And one day, I'm reading through Ephesians, and I see that, and it jumps off the page, and it jumps into my heart. I know people are uncomfortable with that. Here's how people are comfortable praying. Lord, we pray for John and Sally. Heal them if it be thy will. If not, it's okay. It's not me we're praying for, it's them. So just go ahead and, you know, whatever, Lord. Whatever. Holy cow. Is that a prayer? <laughs> is, that really, is that really a prayer? I don't think so. So, friends, I want you to think about those you're, you're praying about. Some of them will come up in a few minutes on this list just above my head. And then many countless others will come to your, to your mind, come to your heart. You'll think about them. And then maybe somebody you love. And you've been through. Paul said, I've been through sorrows. But God healed Epaphroditus because he didn't want me to go through another sorrow of losing a friend. Holy cow. I don't know what that speaks to you, but that just speaks volumes to me. So let's pray right now, me and you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, thanking you. You are so good. You are so good. God, you are so good to me. And we're thankful, Lord, for your goodness. And Lord, I think that... The, that all of us, I believe that 100% of the people who will watch this video this week, and some are watching it right now, but others later in the week, I think that we can all agree. I, I, won't, I, I think we can all agree pretty much as a nation that we've had about all the COVID that we can stand. It has brought to us sorrow upon sorrow. We have heart wounds in this city, in the city of Flora, in Mississippi, we've lost loved ones, husbands, wives we've seen. We've lost pastors that are part of our connection to the COVID. We've lost our health, Lord. We've lost some friends over it, over debates, over masks and vaccines and all that. We've lost friends. We've lost church people. They, they, they won't ever come back to church. Some are just living in fear, Lord, and every time we speak faith, it hurts their feelings. So, Lord, I, uh, I, 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 and Lord, I'm not speaking just for me. I believe that I'm speaking for everybody, that we're ready to see a mighty deliverance come upon our nation. Lord, this sick list that we run every Sunday and our, our list of unspoken requests, there are few, if any, on that list that are COVID-related. Lord, there are other issues that we're dealing with. 
multiple myeloma, lymphoma, uh, leukemia, uh, arthritis, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, uh, organ failures, high blood pressure, uh, neuropathy. Lord, we have friends and loved ones who sit next to us. Uh, multiple sclerosis. We have right here in our church. Multiple sclerosis. Lord, there are, there's a friend on the list who lives here in Florida. He's not in this church, but he has Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, Lord, there are those with lung diseases, kidney diseases, liver diseases. There are those with whose bones are broken. Just the act of standing up uh, creates such stress that their bones are brittle and they begin to break. has nothing to do with corona. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name for those who are watching this morning who they themselves are wrestling with, with uh, these diseases or they know someone who is. Lord, a, a case of the shingles that is devastating uh, uh, a church member, a friend. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would bring a mighty deliverance. Bring a mighty deliverance to your people. And Lord, yes, do it for them. But don't do it just for them, God. Like Paul said, Lord, when you bless your people, we're all blessed. When, when you healed Epaphroditus, you healed Paul. Paul said, the mercy that, that you showed Epaphroditus, you showed him. So Lord, I ask you to bring healing, Lord. To all of these, Lord, that we name, some of these are unspoken, some of these are on the list, some of these I've been told about, but I'm, I'm uh, not at liberty to repeat. Some of these things are private, but, but Lord, I ask you to bless and to heal for the sake of the kingdom. And I ask you, Lord, to bless and to heal for the sake of the sick one. And I ask you to bless and to heal for the sake of the family of the sick one. And Lord, I ask you to bless and heal others. Do it for me. Do it for me, Lord. Do it for me. You did it. You healed the Paphrodite. Lord, I pray that you would heal those in my congregation that you would do it for me. And I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be lightning fast to give you the praise on the 17th day of October and every day through the rest of eternity. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Friends, we have so much to think about, so much to pray about. But we're taking our prayer ministry to a new level. We have a new revelation. God has spoken to us this morning. It wasn't a, a, a brilliant sermon. It wasn't a nail-biter or a, a, a three-hanky sermon, what we used to call uh, preachers. When I was in seminary, we used to make fun of preachers who sweat while they preach. We call them three-hanky sermons. They, they had to wipe their, you know, wipe their... I'm not, but I'm telling you, Jesus taught us something this morning. And I just want you to press in. Press in and stand on that revelation. Woo, glory to God. I will look forward to seeing you next week, one way or the other. I'll be out of town this week. I'll be uh, about 30 in Northern Virginia, about 30 minutes south of the Pentagon. If you hear something bad happening at the Pentagon, you can be sure of this. I didn't do it. I'll be with the voice of the apostles. I will see Leif Haitland 
and all of those guys, and I will tell him that all y'all said hi. Look, friends, I love you. I can't wait to see you again. God bless you. Hasta la vista, baby.